So hello uh, everyone. I'm happy to welcome all of you to our already 23rd edition in the webinar series on precision physics and fundamental symmetries. My name is Klaus Blaum from the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Prof Professor Yuri Litvinov from GSI Darmstadt in Germany. Yuri is a world leading expert in the field of precision atomic and nuclear physics, experiments in heavy ion storage rings. Yuri obtained his PhD in the year 2003 at the Justus Liebig University in Gießen and did his habilitation in 2011 at the University of Heidelberg, where he became a few years later professor for experimental nuclear physics. Yuri has published by far more than 300 publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals, all with a focus on precision physics and fundamental symmetries. So he really fits perfectly into the seminar series and we are extremely happy that he agreed to give today's lecture. As usual to the audience, in case you have questions, please type them into the chat room or the question and answer box and we will address them at the end of the talk. Yuri, we are looking forward to your presentation on heavy ion storage rings and their use for precision nuclear structure and astrophysics experiments. The floor is yours, Yuri. So uh, thank you very much, Klaus. Stefan and Christian for invitation, I'm very honored. And really that's a new experience for me to give seminars offline without seeing the audience. So let's see how it goes. If there are complaints afterwards, just don't be shy and just tell them. So let me first start with a very simple slide. Why do we really like to do storage rings? Why do we like to do experiments in rings? And the answer is very simple. Rings provide you versatile capabilities for experimental studies. What do we have? And I hope you see the laser pointer. The storage allows you to efficiently use rare species. If you look to all these big accelerator laboratories, CERN, GSI, RICAN, the most expensive part of everything is exactly this very rare species, very rare isotope. Secondary, it could be an uh, exotic atom in very high, uh, high charge state, or it could be a very short-lived radioactive isotope. But that's the most expensive. That's what you really like to study, to isolate, to study. And this is your aim. And storage is providing you efficient use of these species. What else? Cooling. Cooling gives you high quality beams. And normally you have cooling stochastic electrons. Sometimes you can also apply laser cooling. You have recirculation. Your particles revolve in a ring with high frequencies. And this means you can reach high luminosities due to this recirculation. Also, you can use just very, very thin targets. You can use rings for removing of contaminants because it has a high resolving power. As you can imagine, because you do high frequency measurements, you do long path lengths in a magnetic field. So you resolve particles by their mass over charge ratios. You have ultra high vacuum, which allows you on one side to preserve atomic charge states, which is important and will be important also in this lecture. But at the same time, that's why it has here an orange color. At the same time, it lays incredible constraints on the equipment which you can bring into the ring. So it has to be not outgazing, it has to withstand very high temperatures because how to reach vacua of the order of 10 to the minus 15 atmosphere. You have to bake this huge thing, the ring, rings are very big devices, to, to 200, 150, sometimes even higher temperature for a significant amount of time. For instance, if we bake ESR, GSI, that's basically a sauna. So you enter the cave and you basically can leave the cave again. Okay, you can use various targets, and targets are listed here on the right. You can use electrons, you can use photons by coupling lasers to the straight sections of the ring. You use atoms, 
that's an internal target. And I just show you this internal target at GSI, uh, like this. That's a photo of the target at, at GSI at ESR. So the beam goes here from right to left. And on top you have a tank with a gas at high pressure. And here at the interface to vacuum, still remember we have 10 to the minus 15 atmosphere in the vacuum and the vacuum size, the tube is something like 250 millimeters in diameter. You have just a few micrometer hole into which the gas is just gets with ultrasonic speed into the vacuum. Actually, that's not a, that's not a miracle. It's easy to let gas into a vacuum system. The whole story is how to pump all that gas such that you do not deposit gas into the ultra high vacuum. So you have to preserve the vacuum and at the same time you achieve a target. So we get targets of basically every gas which we like to have, which gives us huge opportunities for experiments. What else? You have high detection efficiencies for recoils, either target-like recoils or recoils from the reaction beam-like recoils. You have numerous dedicated detectors. I'm not going to discuss all of those, just a few. And you detect electrons, photons, recoils. You can do beam accumulation, we will get to this. You have large acceptance, okay, that's a big device. And important, we can do acceleration or deceleration. You can adjust the energy of the beam to the needs of a particular experiment. Last but not least, we are able to measure currents, so non-destructively measure currents to an incredible sensitivity. And I will show this later and just discuss this are our devices for current measurements. Okay, going further. There are the moment three facilities which employ storage in for identifying beam research. And these are at GSI, the top two pictures. I will come to them later. You have at the right bottom here, you have a collector um, cooler storage ring experimental at the Institute of Modern Physics in Lanzhou. And you have uh, since recently also the R3 storage ring at Triton. All these things are coupled to radioactive beam facilities and they are unique in the world. What is their main properties? They stay for single particle sensitivity. I will show this several times in my lecture. They have broadband measurements, Still, these are big devices and many different isotopes feed into large acceptance. You can do higher atomic charge states, which is also essential, and all of them high, have high resolving power. These unique capabilities, in principle, allow you to get huge now amount of huge number of different physics cases. Surely, I cannot address all of those. As well, I cannot go into details of the symmetry testing, atomic physics, high precision atomic physics experiments. I just can mention only very few cases and I decided to concentrate on something like nuclear effects on atomic decay rates and astrophysical reactions. These are two cases which we just finished, two experiments, and that allows me to update you on the present status. Okay, GSI, those who don't those who don't know GSI, GSI is a facility in Darmstadt near Frankfurt and is composed of uh, several sources, a linear accelerator. Linear accelerator allows you to accelerate beams to something like 10 mV per nucleon. Then we have a heavy ion synchrotron which further accelerates the beams up to 18 tesla meter which corresponds to 1.5 GeV per nucleon uranium 73 plus. Then we have a production target in front of the fragment separator where we can produce, if you like, exotic nuclei, which is then separated by the in-flight fragment separator and injected into the storage chain. And these are two hour storage chain devices. This is a original 108 meter long experimental storage ring, which is composed of many magnets and many devices. These orange ones are the dipole magnets, the quadrupoles are colored in red, and there are, I, when I give guided tools, I always say that the quadrupoles, they have some errors, which you have to correct. Therefore, there are sextuples. Sextuples have errors. You have to correct for those. You have to put octuples, and then in the end, you have also correction coils inside the 
magnets and so on. Very precise device. You see it colored everywhere with these jackets, which are used for heating. And as I already told you, the diameter of the vacuum pipes is 250 millimeters. It's an operation since 1990, and we have 10 to the minus 12 millibar, which corresponds to 10 to the minus 15 atmosphere. And that's what we call ultra high vacuum. You have electron stochastic cooling, and we can store beams in a wide energy range, starting from about 400, 420 mV per nucleon down to 3 mV per nucleon. You can slow and fast extract. And then since recently, we constructed a dedicated low energy extortion. That's, that's a photo of it in the cave, which has been taken into operation with beams from the ESA just a few months ago. Basically not a few months, but more or less two months ago. It has the circumference just half of the ESR to be able to easily transport beams from the ESR to current, and it's already in the extra high vacuum regime. Ah, it's the same time as one cylinder, but it's an order of magnitude better than in the ESR. We have electron cooling, and the main advantage of this B of this ring is that we can basically go to very, very low energies. Actually, there is no lower limit. The limit is given by the recombination of ions with the residual gas. So, astrophysics. You listened to several already webinars on astrophysics and what are the questions which actually stand in front of us? We like to understand how all these isotopes were produced on, in the universe. What is plotted here is a typical nucleic chart where the black squares are the stable isotopes and everything which is colored in different colors are artificially produced nuclei at various facilities and also shown are with lines at various astrophysical processes. We know that about 50% of all isotopes, no, sorry, heavy isotopes are produced in the S process which occurs in the large stars and this goes via the neutron captures and beta decays along the stability line and ends at the lead bismuth because it cannot cross over the yellow region of short-lived alpha decays. We know that in supernova explosions, we destroy the heavy seed nuclei producing the S and later in the R process pass and produce these isotopes this most neutron deficient, this left black squares, um, they're called P nuclei. We know that in the binary systems on surfaces of neutron stars, we get the so-called rapid proton capture process, which might even get to tin tellurium region. And last but not least, we know that we have to produce thorium and uranium, which are here on the top. So we have to have a so-called R process pass, and a few more passes, but, uh, um, which is believed to occur in the neutron star mergers as well as supernova. And um, that's a photo of here in the, this photo of the so-called kilo nowhere, which has been taken uh, simultaneously with gravita gravitational waves observation in 2017 and several tens of, um, space telescopes and reverse observatories. So, and what do we need to understand all this process? What do we need to understand uh, the physics there? Actually, we need to know the rates of relevant reactions. On the RP products, we need to know the P capture cross sections, the two proton capture cross sections. On the P process, we need to know the photodissociation cross section, gamma alpha, gamma P. On the R process path, we need to know the neutron capture cross sections, but also we need to know the masses because they actually determine the energetics in all this process and they actually allow us to plot all these processes on the nucleic charts. Last but not least, the better half life they reflect the final elemental abundances which are produced in these processes. I will only shortly touch the masses. And um, one second. So, and you see that we have to go far away from the value of stability if we like to start the R process. R process at the moment is the key objective of um, 
radioactive ion beam facilities to get to this very neutron rich nuclei and to study their properties. And we know not much at the moment. So, what is the problem? The problem is very simple. If you look here on the left, you see here the cross section or the yields. This is a fair picture for, for the made for fair. So we assume here 10 to the 12 um, primary beam intensity. And what you see, you see the fragmentation cross section and the fission cross section measured for different teen isotopes. And as a rule of thumb, you can already see that to get one more nucleus away from the stability, you basically need uh, or your yield fails or by the order of magnitude. So in order to get here, you need at least 10 times higher cross section or 10 times higher sensitivity of your experiment. And the R process starts somewhere there. And you see we are short-lived and we have very small cross-sections. So, and that's what said on the right. Nuclides of the interest today are, as a rule, short-lived and have tiny production cross-sections. So we need to have interesting, or we have to get ingenious methods to get to the cheese, like in this picture. So we have a mouse which tries to get to the cheese and we can assume that it's our radioactive isotope, this cheese. And if we have a maze and we have just one isotope, we can try to go through the whole range, but we have only one and the probability that we get to, uh, to a dead end is very high. So if we would have the time. However, we, we also have, even if we knew the way, the time is so short for this nucleus, so then by the time we get to the cheese, we already decayed and we have no chance. So you have to get something which you just smash through the labyrinth and get to the cheese with a very fast and efficient technique. So concerning the masses, I just show only this slide, which we prepared once as a report, and it's still relatively old. But what you see, measure, uh, what is shown here as a red and blue color coded nuclei, which are measured by pinion traps or multi-reflection time of light spectrometers, and in red by the storage rings. Since recently, our three storage ring is an operation you provide first measurements around nickels and around iodine, oh, sorry, iodines around anodines and uh, Z equal 15 neutron rich isotopes. The perfect device at the moment is CSRE, and if one can see, that's an old picture, possible positions for new time of flight detectors. Actually, this has become a reality which boosted dramatically the accuracy and the sensitivity of the method. And be aware, soon there will be a beautiful results from, from this device, which uh, have huge potential. So on the masses, I would like to point you to the webinar by Klaus Blaum, our chair today. He has given it a few months ago, and as I know, they're all recorded, so you may just look in more details on this mass measurement device. I would like to switch to radioactive decays and radioactive decays of highly charged ions. Why do we like to study those? First of all, the few electron ions are well-defined quantum mechanical systems. If I have zero electrons, okay, it's clear, so it's a pure nucleus. If I have one electron, I definitely know its quantum state. I know that it's in the lowest hyperfine state if hyperfine splitting is um, initial. If I have two electron systems, I can also calculate very precisely atomic structure. And I can actually look to the decays without taking into account complicated electron-electron interaction. I can look to new decay modes, which are not available in neutral atoms, bound pair creation, bound state beta decay, um, bound internal transition, and others. I can look explicitly on the screening of electrons electron-electron um, interaction and see whether the electrons, the interplay actually gets an effect on the radioactive decay. And last but not least, in our 
scope we are talking about astrophysical scenarios at high temperatures and high densities, which we actually have in stellar objects, we have high degree of ionization. So how do we do this? And here, just a simple picture. Here from top to bottom is a time of storage in the storage in ASR at GSI. And here horizontally plotted is the frequency. And what we see is with a colored code is the measured frequency resolved current. And this current is so, this measurement is so sensitive, so we see single ions. And what happens, for instance, to this? This is 175 rhenium with two electrons. For those who don't remember, rhenium is element 75. And after 180 seconds, it decided that two electrons are too many for this rhenium, and it decides to capture one, and captures one electron and turns into a tungsten, element 74, with one electron. However, you see disappearance here and appearance here. This tungsten was already not the first one, but it appeared via the continuum three body beta decay of rhenium one electron or with one electron. And you see already the broad band of the storage rings that you have the same isotope rhenium in two different charge states. They are separated in frequency, but they are stored at the same time in the ring. Okay, and later there is another decay. So if you look in a you can also look to oops. You can also look to the development of intensity versus time, and here time goes also from left to right. And this was a measurement of actinium 88 plus, actinium is element 89, so it's one electron actinium. And that was the discovery of this isotope for the first time measurement of its mass, as well as measurement of its decay in one experiment. We can look more carefully to the time. And here I apologize for reversing the time direction. So the time now runs from bottom to top. And we have each channel just merely 32 milliseconds. And we have injected three ions, 342 pm ions, promethium. Promethium is element 61, so it's a 59 plus with two electrons. And we have three ions. Why do we know that we have three ions? because we have also very high time resolution, and we see how we cool by electrons three ions together. What is electron cooling? One may ask. Electron cooling, it's a merged electron beam with our ion beam, which forces the ions to the same velocity as the electrons. And since the mass of the ion is given and we have a magnetic field which is constant, this means that all ions have to converge to the same frequency. So what happens afterwards? Afterwards, we see that one ion at this very time disappeared and appeared to the left and then gets slowly um, moved to this frequency. How to interpret this? Very simple. At this very moment, you have an electron capture decay. So you capture one of these two electrons and turn into promethium decays by electron capture to neodymium with one electron. And this tail is nothing else than the recoil of the promethium ion due to the emission of electron neutrino. You can say, okay, why it goes from left to right? This means that this ion neodymium has to be accelerated by the electron, electrons of the cooler to its nominal frequency. And this means that the neutrino has been emitted forward, making this neodymium slower. The second decay, which is later, is the opposite, uh, opposite situation. In this case, the second ion disappearing here turns into the neodymium ion, which is now too fast. So the neutrino has been emitted in the backward direction, and uh, the ion is getting slowed by the electrons to it. So if you look, to this overall, we can have this high, this high resolving power, we can look to the emission of the neutrino and actually tell when the neutrino is so. This can be used, for instance, to check the polarization of the, of the ions in the ring, but that's a long way to go. Okay, so having said about our experimental capabilities, let us go to one case. So we studied two body beta decays. The electron capture I have already told you, in the electron capture, you capture one of the protons in your nucleus, captures a 
bound electron, you know that the bound electrons have the probability, their wave functions have an overlap with the nucleus, so they have the probability to be inside the nucleus. It turns into a neutron and then needs a monochromatic neutrino. Electron capture you know very well. If you do know the time mirror symmetry on that, we can have a neutron in a nucleus decaying into a proton plus a bound electron and plus an electron antineutrino. So the only thing which is here is that I don't capture the electron neutrino, I just emit an electron antineutrino. And then these two pictures are identical under the time mirror symmetry. So, and we will now look to this bound state beta decay. What is bound state beta decay? On the left, you see the normal, ordinary three body beta decay. You have a nucleus in which one neutron decays into a proton and emits an electron and emits an electron and a neutrino. The electron must leave the atom because all the orbitals are filled with electrons. And the power of principle tells us that the electron just doesn't have place to, to land. However, if we remove all the electrons and jump to the right picture, and we have now overall vacancies, then the electron can just jump on one of the three orbitals. And what we know from the university is that the decay energy or the phase space available can dramatically change the beta decay probability. In this case, if you have a heavy nucleus, this binding energy can change our decay probability. And we know that the beta decay probability scales with the Q value available decay energy to the power of five, or actually for the two body decay to the power of three, but that's, that's still a high power. The Bonstead beta decay has been discovered at GSI. It has been proposed in the 40s, but discovered it has been at GSI already that was one of the first experiments at the ESR, and already in 1992 it has been published. And as you remember, ESR was taken into operation in 90. And in this case, one actually looked to this prosium 163, which is stable, but it becomes radioactive if you remove the electrons. And furthermore, if you assume the S process, then in the S process, in the AGB stars, and this 163, this prosium has an ionization degree which allows it to decay to holmium, then holmium by capturing the neutron turns into holmium-164, which also decays in both directions. And by looking to erbium-164 abundance, one can actually draw a conclusion on the ionization degree of this prosium to actually reproduce the erbium abundance. And that was at that time the estimated temperature in these large stars of the order of 30 keV, which was for that time a very good number. Okay, since then there were several bound state beta decay measurements, but one of the measurements was elusive for a very long time. If you recall, and Paul Kinley was the director of GSI who actually decided to extend it to build this high energy part, which we know now. And here he's um, discussions for Schumann Focus and Paul Kinley and Fritz Bosch and colleagues were all the time pushing for one particular bound state beta decay. And that was one of the cases, physics cases, for the construction of the ESR itself. And what are this? This is the bound state beta decay of 205 thallium nuclei. This was a title page of the proposal submitted to GSI and has been approved with highest priority A, and we got 21 shifts of main beam time allocated. So, so far so good. What do we like to study there? If you look to this thallium lead couple, thallium is stable. Lead is radioactive with a lifetime of 70.3 million years. It decays five half minus to one half plus ground state, ground state transition with the lowest QEC value we know. It's 51 keV, just. So nothing special. Please note that there is an excited state in lead just at very few, at very low energy, 2.3 keV. 2.3 keV 
is very low energy if you imagine for instance in the center of the sun this um, where we have 15 kV or so we have these two states thermally populated if you now remove the electrons the energetics changes and by exactly saving this binding energy all the electron the thallium nucleus can now decay to lead nucleus the quantum states one half plus decay one half plus to one half minus has a much preferential selection rules and then you proceed to the excited state of this nucleus the estimated lifetime is something like 120 days plus minus a factor of three which can extend to a year the q beta bound state beta is 31 k so why do we like to know first of all this 205 thallium lead is at the termination of the s process path so if you have lead 205 in any temperature conditions let's say in any star or so then we know that we have this 2.3 state populated and this decay one half minus one half plus will be much faster than this 70 million years so this decay probability from 205 to 205 thallium will be larger if you have somewhere such high temperatures that the thallium is fully ionized or at least the k shell is empty hydrogen like or fully ionized then it may decay within a year back to that so that's important to know how to as process will pass here it also tells us actually affects the fate of 205 lead in the early solar system and can give constraints on actually the origin of our solar system last but not least this low q value may allow us to construct a very sensitive very low threshold solar neutrino detector what do we really mean by this if you look to this updated picture from different that's a solar so this is a solar neutrino flux here's the flux itself on the ordinate and energy threshold of the energy of the neutrinos on the horizontal axis and here on top you see different thresholds for different experiments and lorax and that's that's a project i will say in a second using the thallium 205 would have the lowest ever threshold for the neutrino detection what is lorax lorax is a project which is built on the geological experiment which looks to a detector which exists on earth by itself it looks to the so-called lorandit minerals the thallium arsenic sulfur 2 and these are available in a reasonable amount in macedonia at a given depth and it's very well known from archaeology how when these minerals were created one knows the chemical composition and one just likes to say this is 4.3 million years ago these minerals were created and now the question is if one looks to the amount of lead 205 in these minerals and we know that by the time the, the minerals were created there were no lead 205 there then we can actually determine the average neutrino pp neutrino flux plus the composition of plus the contributions for high energies over the last 4.3 million years and there was a project discussion in december and what do you need for this actually you need to know the matrix element of capturing capturing thallium 205 neutrino to the 1.2 one half minus state in lead this matrix element you have to know how do you know this matrix element well you measure the bound state better decay because the matrix element remains the same so and that's what we are going to do so we had this experiment scheduled right in the middle of the corona pandemic this corona pandemic gave us uh, originally you were scheduled until 1st of april but we get got an extension by five days 
due to the fact that it was not easy to run experiments during the corona pandemic. So what do we do? And why this experiment was not done before? Well, so far we had always stable beams to measure long lifetimes. Actually, 205 time is also stable, but unfortunately it's poisonous and then we are not allowed to in Germany and Darmstadt area to accelerate this talon in the, to put it into inosaurs. So we have to produce an inradiative reaction in the nuclear reaction. So we use the enriched 206 lead beam. We got something like two to three times 10 to the nine particles per spill. We produce this beam with the 205 talon in a beryllium target in front of the fragment separator. And our problem was that uh, we have to separate thallium 81 plus from lead 81 plus. And the intensity ratio is something like 1 to 15. So for each thallium, we have 15 lead ions. And these lead ions are our daughter nuclei. So that's a huge background. So in order to measure and to measure precisely the lifetime of the order of one year, you have to get rid of all this background. Hmm. So we used all possible tricks, which we know as a fragment separator. And in the end, we got less than a percent of lead, actually 0.1 to 0.3 percent of lead contamination in the ESR. We have to accumulate the beam because one year, one can estimate that something like 10 to the seven seconds and if you like to have, for instance, one decay per second, this means we have to have 10 to the seven particles. Then we have to wait for a long time. And then we have again to separate now thallium 81 plus from lead 81 plus, which are not separatable with any modern mass measurement techniques. So TKV difference on top of 205 GeV total mass, for these two intense beams, there is no device which can separate this. So you have to find a trick how to count number of decades. So that's, that's roughly the scheme how it is done. So we inject the beam, we do stochastic cooling, we move the beam to, to an internal position where we can stack it and cool it and keep it. And then we repeat every 15 seconds with stacking, 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 stacking. And in the end, here on top, you see the current in the synchrotron and we slowly accumulate the beam in the storage room. And here we have many minutes, we accumulated for half an hour or so, which actually fine if you consider that the lifetime of the ions is one year. So then we do long, long, long waiting time. In this case, it's a five hours measurement and we reduce the cooler current to the lowest possible uh, value to avoid recombination. At this very moment, we got a failure of the electron cooler and there was a guy on shift who noticed this and could repair it, could, could switch it on back before we lost the beam. And in the end here, we switch on the argon jet. And why do we do the argon? because we like to strip the electron, we use exactly the large acceptance of the ring that the different charge states of the same nucleus, of the same yeah, nucleus or the, can actually be stored in the ring simultaneously. So we strip off the single bound electron from the daughter ions 205 flat, which then jump onto a specific orbit where we're just waiting for them. And thallium, what happens to thallium? It doesn't have electrons, so it stays there where it had. Okay, surely the decay constant here changes dramatically because argon causes also recombination. And we lose a lot of ions by recombination, but we count them as well. So, and that's what happens at the specific frequency where we see the clean beam of 205 flat, now 82 plus without electrons, and now we can count them. So we had, since we did long waiting times, we didn't need an online protocol book. So we just used the sheet on top of there and we see so half an hour, zero hour measurements are needed to check the contamination by lead 
And then we have one hour measurement, five hours measurement. And then we had two and then our students, and that was one of our problems that with the manpower during this COVID was pretty much restricted. So that's Ragandip who actually was sleeping there in between the runs and uh, with an alarm clock and was just changing the runs. And this is our preliminary data. We obviously see we just measure the ratio of the lead to original intensity of talium, and we see the growth, which, which gives a very nice number, but I will not tell it to you at the moment. I actually uh, washed it away. And, but soon we will report the number and the consequences of this measurement. So that's one experiment and another experiment which I'd like to address using the capabilities of ring, these are reaction studies. Ah, sorry, one more thing I have to note that we are very thankful to our friends from IMP because they send us the masks and actually uh, on the back you see here this beam is a 205 talium beam stored in the ring and that was very kind and very nice and very helpful from our colleagues from Alonso. Thank you. I'd like to jump to nuclear reactions in storage. And we started this not very far, not very long time ago. So what do we have? We have in-flight fragmentation of ZFRS. So you have access to radioactive nuclear. This we did already. We have deceleration of beams. We can go directly to the gamma window of astrophysical process. I repeat this again, we have high revolution frequency, so we can gain high luminosity even if you use very thin targets. And thin targets here is the key because the targets are so thin, so we have only one collision. We do not have a probability for having two collisions in the target, and we do not have energy loss and so on. Well-known atomic charge exchange rates we used for the in-situ luminosity monitoring. And this is a very nice example of merging experiences and um, expertises from atomic and nuclear physics. We do this ultra thin windowless gas targets together with electron cooling, which gives us excellent energy resolution. But also this windowless is extremely important because we do not have contributions, background contributions. We detect the ions by entering particle detectors we have very clean beam, we have very clean target, we have low background and very high efficiency. So the target, for instance, we so far use hydrogen targets, but it's, we are not limited to that. We will in the future use also the alpha targets, so the helium targets as well as we can do deuterium, deuterium targets and so on. Uh, there are proposals for using those. We are on the order of 10 to the 14 atoms per centimeter square and we do not deteriorate our high vacuum. So this is a very efficient use of exotic beams for high resolution experiments. And how do we do? So we inject the ions at high energy because we like to have them without electrons. There are various reasons for this. If you have questions, please ask me. So we store the beam, we decelerate it to the energy we like to have, and then we merge cooled beam with an internal gas jet target. What happens in the target? In the target, we can do two reaction types. One is we can capture an electron from hydrogen atomically. So we can capture on a free atomic orbital the electron, and then we change the charge to a lower one. And then we bend less by the dipole magnet, and we go to outside of the ring where we can put a counter. We can capture proton nuclear reaction and then we increase the charge, and then we are bent more by the dipole, and we go to the inside of the ring, where we also put a counter on a specific orbital to intercept specific orbitals. And you see already, if you know this cross section for the atomic charge exchange, the ratio of counts on these two detectors gives you immediately the wanted nuclear cross section. Actually, Jan, our postdoc, actually calls this whole scheme as a recycling recoil separator because we use this dipole as a separator and ring as a recycler. So how do we do measure the atomic things? So in situ luminosity monitoring. 
We actually put the X-ray detectors around the gas jet target and then measure the X-rays from, from the interaction zones. If energy high enough and allows to penetrate through the thin but still not negligible stainless steel windows of the gas detector, which is inserted here, and we have to use gas detectors because these cross sections for atomic capture are in the mega band region. So we have very high count rate here. So we basically have to stand with the gas detectors. So we have to put them behind the window. Then we can also measure the charge exchange products. But normally for low energies, we stay with the X-ray measurements. And uh, what do we do? Okay. And then we had first test beam time in 200, 2016 where we use xenon P gamma to produce 125 cesium. And these are the calculations of the rates. We see the energy in the center of mass, so xenon plus proton. And here's a cross section of the order of something like 10 millibars for the energies between four and eight mm per nucleum. And here are different thresholds. So at something like 6.7 mm per nucleum, we have the, the PN channel open. And before we have the P gamma nearly dominating, um, dominating reaction channel. So this nucleus as it in itself has physical, uh, has a physics case. And what we did, we had to invent um, very sensitive, but also ultra high vacuum capable, capable double-sided silicon strip detectors. It has to be mounted on a long frame. I will explain in a second why. And they have, in this case, we have, I don't know, remember 16 by 16 pins on the, on the detector. We have it UHV compatible, which means that it's in a standard mode, low outgassing, but actually it is bakeable because we have to bake the whole detector setup to be able to insert it into the ring. So why do we need this long frame? Because we need to detect ions inside the dipole, but even inside the dipole. And this is a C-type magnets with an opening to outside. So here the yoke, we cannot actually, we do not have access there. So we have to insert detector from outside over the whole aperture of the ring to the inside and also do not disturb the other two beams. So here it's schematically shown. So we move on a very long arm, we move the detector inside, and here we have this frame. It's basically a hole for the primary beam as well as for the electron capture, atomic capture products to pass through and land them on the detector here. So this detector in our case is now moved to inside here, but this detector stays there where it is. And here's a photo of the detector again. So what do we have? And we measure something like that. We see here the beam and then 1.5 centimeters away from the beam, we have this double-sided silicon strip detector. And this is nothing else than the reservoir scattering because we have a scattering of xenon on proton target. And here's an obvious P gamma cross-section peak or P gamma reaction products peak. And that's our results, which has been published by Jan just one year ago. And we measured at 80 mu per nucleon, and we see here already on the right hand side, we see some counts. This is already the open PN channel. At 7 mv, you hardly see, but you can identify a few. At 6.7, there is nothing, 6 and 5 mv. But we see also at the 5.5 mv, we already have here some artifact. It's not an artifact, it's our detector, silicon detector, being damaged by high count rate of the reservoir scattering. And this is the data points. And you see we can slowly enter into the gamma window, or so we like to go much lower in energy. So, and Rene Reifert, as a spokesperson, put forward the experiment in 2017, and we got, again, the highest priority A, and we got 15 sheets of main beam time to actually show Stable beam is fine. To finally show that we can apply our GSI facility, our radioactive ion beam facility, and measure radioactive uh, proton capture reaction on a radioactive ion beam. And this we do 
within our new Quran community. So experiment has been again scheduled during the COVID-19, a little bit earlier, actually just before the bounce the beta decay measurement. We got the second beam from the FRS. We got our 15 shifts. We selected a simple case to prove the feasibility of this radio beam reaction study. Unfortunately, our new accelerator control system prevented us from getting to a low energy and we had to stay at 10 mm per nucleon. That's, that's a very unfortunate situation because the PN channel is dominant until you see this in a second. We learned the lesson that the reservoir scattering causes us a problem. And Laszlo Varga, a PhD student, made thorough simulations and suggested to insert a scraper just in front of the dipole magnet. So we have here a target where the nuclear reaction happens as well as the reservoir scattering. But the reservoir scattering has an angle right away from the interaction point and goes into the dipole and then lands on our detector. While the nuclear reaction product gets deflected only in magnetic field. So if we can remove the reservoir scattering by just cutting away the orbitals in front of the dipole, it may hopefully clean up our beam. That's a passive sc uh, scraper which we have inserted in this location and we will replace it later on by the active scraper because reservoir scattering used to actually turn to be also very useful for luminosity measurement. Uh, well, so that's a simulation and now this is the result. That's a xenon, again, xenon primary beam. And what you see, if you do not use scraping, we have here reservoir scattering, which you like actually to kill, to remove. Here's the P gamma counts, and here's the PN, because we are at 10 mm per nucleum above the PN threshold. And now if you insert the scraper, the reservoir is gone. The P gamma is now obviously clearly seen. Okay, and the PN channel should be dominant at this energy. We obviously show that we can remove the reservoir scattering and by doing this we increase, we boost our sensitivity and we can go to lower energies and also to lower cross sections. And by going to lower energies, we will remove the PM channel as well from the detector or alternatively we can actually think how to measure the PM reaction rates as well. For the tellurium itself, for the radioactive beam, Unfortunately, we have very low intensity from the accelerator. And also at 10 mm per nucleon, the PN channel is dominant. We obviously have a signature of the P-gamma cross-section. There are a few counts. And we have a strong PN. But okay, in a sense, that's the first ever measurement of the P-gamma cross-section, a decelerated low energy beam in a storage room, which actually shows that this is feasible and also shows that we have a bright future in this respect. And that's Laszlo, who is the main person behind. Remember this theme. I think it's, he's a good guy. Okay, and now I have three slides of outlook. The outlook number one. We have now this beautiful crying facility, which is a dedicated low energy ring. And if storage in ESR here, is able to slow down the beam by to something like three mm per nucleon, which is already very tough because it's a dedicated high energy machine. Cryrin has no low energy limit. So we can take over the beam to cryrin, let's say 10, 15 mm per nucleon. It has also very capability to slow beams faster down. We can go to much lower energies. Also, another advantage, it has half a circumference of the ESR, which immediately doubles the luminosity. And um, with this, we have already a huge program for nuclear reaction studies. I'd like to mention only one. It's uh, our friends from Edinburgh has be have built already, actually they commissioned this universal reaction setup at the crying, here would be the gas jet, and here in forward and backwards directions, there would be systems of silicon detectors to measure various transfer reactions, capture reactions, and many, many other reaction channels. Last but not least, I'd like to mention at this point also the 
ERC grant of Beatrice from Bordeaux, congratulations Beatrice, which also proposes to use cryonic for neutron induced reactions. At that moment, we surrogate the action method. As you remember, the neutron capture reactions, actually the neutron induced processes are the major key at the moment for understanding the nuclear synthesis, because in the R process, the neutron capture reactions are needed. Um, the outlook number two is relates to the ring at Isolde. It has been a very interesting project. And um, there is a design by Manfred Griese and Aaron at CERN, the work on actually design of this storage And it is also on the, on the list of possible upgrades of Isolde facility in this new high energy physics strategy developed by CERN now. And why it is so important? The problem with the crying and the problem with GSI is the following. By doing this whole cycle, storing, slowing down, bunching, extraction, slowing down, we lose about a minute. So we can actually aim at ionic species which are longer than about a minute. Okay, a minute is a lower number. So actually the longer leaf nuclear, longer leaf species. Whereas the main interest which we have actually is in the shorter leaf species. And that would facilitate the Zolder where you just accelerate the beams, which is much quicker, be a more suited facility. Okay, and then I have the last slide, which is a longer term project. And that's a Rene Reifert actually realizing that neutron induced reactions are extremely important, suggest to use either reactor, but this will never happen. The reactor people are very conservative, but maybe by using a spallation, a local spallation source in a heavy water and two inter intersecting, so to put a ball of heavy water in a straight section of a ring, produce by spallation a lot of neutrons, which then would quickly thermalize and intersect the vacuum pipe to the ions and then have here a radioactive beam to study neutron induced reaction. This may be feasible and we are working on this. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And especially I'd like to thank also the guys at our nuclear collaboration, Spark, Lima, also Max Planck Institute, and our PhD students, unfortunately, Rajo Chen, our postdoc is not present here, but there is Laszlo, there is Ragandip, there is Jan, Jan is here, and and many colleagues from all around the world. Many, many things.